Um, so I will talk today about um, the work I've been doing with Open Forest Field Initiative. Um, specifically, I'll talk about um, the torsion fitting pipe, pipeline, uh, particularly um, generating data for um, torsion scans. So um, first, a little bit about but why why is this thing like still? How do you get rid of that? Mm -hmm. okay. X is like the X. Ah, it's your mouse down now. But no, no. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have a mouse. <laughs> oh well. Should, should I try? Should I try to get the mouse on again? Or whatever. Anyway. Okay, it's fine. Um, so. Um, the Open Forest Field um, Initiative is a collaboration between several labs and industry partners to improve forest fields. Um, we also have software developers, software engineers, which really help um, out with the software aspects of forest field development. So, Okay, so let, sorry, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. So let's 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 do that again. The spotlight thing, because that was working. So sorry, it's just going to have to be there. Maybe you can drag the little window to your other monitor and then plug it away. This thing? Yeah, I'm not sure if that works. No, it doesn't work. All right, so. Okay. It doesn't show up on those anymore. I spelled Daniel by the way. Oh. Okay. <laughs> All right. Whoever's playing the drums, please stop. Okay. I guess. Okay. I guess I figured out how to. Sorry. I don't know why this is on right today. Um, okay. So the goal of Open Forest Field Initiative is to develop um, open, scalable toolkits um, that automatically parameterize forest fields. Um, also to generate and curate open data sets um, that can be used for producing um, small molecule forest fields and for other um, applications too, and also to systematically improve forest fields. So um, I will talk about generating data for torsion parameters. Um, the pipeline includes several different aspects, but I'll focus only on fragmentation and indexing the database. So first of all, what is the torsion potential? So what, what, is, what, what is the torsion energy and why do we need to generate data for it? Um, so the torsion energy of a molecule is the energy of the molecule as it rotates about its central bond. And in most force field, this is given as a sum of cosines to the truncated Fourier series where um, the K, the force constant, determines the barrier heights, um, the N is the multiplicity, and then you have the phase angle. Um, but, and the way the data is usually generated um, for these parameters is you hold the dihedral angle, which is the angle between the two planes formed by um, atoms one, two, three, and two, three, four. You hold that at a certain value and then do a geometry optimization to allow the other degrees of freedom to relax and calculate the energy. Uh, but it's important to note that the torsion parameters are not fitted directly to the Fourier series, it's actually fitted to the residuals. So some people see this as more as a dumping ground for all the errors of the 1-4 interactions. Um, so anyway, that's what, that's what the torsion um, potential is. Now, um, QC torsion scans are quite expensive to generate because you need to um, do several geometry optimizations. Okay, so what does the torsion fitting pipeline include? Um, first, the molecule comes in, and um, we need to enumerate the ionization states, protonation states, and tautomers, which is not that easy, but it will, it's beyond the scope of this talk, so I will not talk about it right now. Um, once we have um, all the states of the molecules, the molecule needs to be fragmented in such a way that you don't destroy the chemistry of this fragment inside its parent's molecule. Once you have the fragments, um, you have to run torsion scans, um, and sometimes you need to run um, multidimensional torsion scans, which means scanning several torsions together, um, which is um, even more expensive. Um, this is done um, currently um, using the 
really amazing QC archive project, um, which automates the torsion scans um, and then and then stores all the data, annotates it, and it's an open data set that database that everyone can access. And then once we have the data, um, the torsion parameters are fit to this data, um, either using force balance or um, in the future using Bayesian inference. Um, so the full stack of the software involved um, in this pipeline has been developed by many different people. Um, so Daniel Smith, um, Doa, and Levi um, have been working on the MOLSI QC archive project, um, and then Li Ping and Yu Dung have worked on the um, you know, geometry optimization, multidimensional torsion scans, and of course there's also sci um, that does the um, QC calculations. Okay, so first um, I will talk about indexing the molecules for the quantum chemistry database. Um, okay, why is this important? So different communities um, in computational chemistry have different representation of molecules. Um, and so when we initially started talking about QC archive, about, about an open database um, for QC um, molecules, we realized that um, you know, different communities think about it differently. So in, in the quantum chemistry community, molecules are represented has you know, XYZ coordinates and elements, and that's it. There's no connectivity. Um, you know, that's just the way um, they think about molecules, and each conformation is in general considered another molecule. Um, in the molecular mechanics community, um, we think of molecules as a conformational distribution, right? All different conformations are the same molecule, and then in chemioinformatics, it's just a graph. Um, but turns out that um, the chemioinformatics um, syntax works really well for combining these different um, representation of molecules. So, um, the, you know, the very popular ones are SMILES and INCHIES. So this SMILE stands for Simplified Molecular Input Line Entry Specification. It's basically a syntax um, for, um, for representing the graphs of the molecule. And INCHI is um, from IUPAC. It's the IUPAC International Chemical Identifier. It's a standardized way of representing molecules. Now, um, the problem um, with, so, so these, these, these um, indices are great, um, but there are um, some issues. So uh, one of the issues with SMILES, SMILES is really good because you can use it for substructure searching and, um, and um, it's also a little more human readable than INCHIES. But the problem is that there is no standardization for SMILES. So um, most, most chemioinformatics toolkits have their own canonicalization algorithm. Um, and even though it's canonical, it turns out that um, after working on this um, for a while, that it's really only canonical within a certain version of a toolkit. So um, I've been maintaining CMILES now for a little under a year, and there were several times where updates in upstream software had changed some of the SMILES in my tests. Um, it's around 1%, so it's not that much, and most of it involved um, stereochemistry, which apparently is pretty complicated. That's why it changes. But the problem is that if you want to make sure that your database um, is sustainable and, you know, data integrity, you need to always be submitting the molecules with the same smiles because otherwise, how are you going to find it, right? Um, usually, you know, these are strings and, you, and it's, it's, you know, the strings have to match if they're different and, you're, you know, you're, you're either going to have redundancy um, or you're not going to be able to find um, the molecule. So what CMILES does is CMILES um, generate, uses different toolkits to generate um, these indices, um, but it will be, we're, we're going to be pinning, I mean, it's not in production yet, um, it's still um, pre-alpha, but we're going to be pinning, once, once it goes into production, we are going to be pinning the toolkit's versions so that um, we know which version of the toolkit generated the smile, so we can always make sure that we're using the same smiles when we're searching and when we're depositing. Um, and 
The other, the other issue um, that CMILES addresses is that, you know, these, these smile strings are, um, there is no order to like the atoms in the molecule. So the indices on the, on the atoms are arbitrary. You can number it in whatever way you want. The problem is that for the QC data, you have XYZ coordinates with symbols and the order matters. And when you submit the smile string and then you submit your, your um, XYZ coordinates and then you want to later come back and recreate the graph, you have a loss of information. As in like, if you generated the, if you generated the XYZ coordinates from this graph that was in one order and then you create a new graph and that's in a different order, it becomes hard to map back um, what information you have in the database um, versus the indices in your graph. So to get around that, um, we are using smiles with tags. So these are math indices um, that um, can then be used as a smart string to do a substructure search, and that gives you back a mapping of the current indices in the graph to where those atoms are in the XYZ coordinates. And, you know, I, I, I did speak to, um, so really if you're always using the same toolkit, you don't really need this because most toolkits will generate the graphs the same way. But the problem is that people use different toolkits and this just, and all toolkits have a way, I mean, most chemi informatics toolkits anyway have a way to use smarts for substructure matching. So whatever toolkit you use, you can get the mapping of the coordinates to, um, to your graph. Does this uh, mean that you need to have the same tags to be able to match something in the database or is that- No, 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 because- Retrieve it. No, so the smiles with the tags are not used for searching. Um, searching is we're using we're going to be using the smiles, just regular smiles, and then you can substructure searching on that. The tagged smiles are there if you want to now you want to take this data and put it into like oh no open eye molecules or, or already kit molecules, and you want to make sure to get the coordinates in. So a canonical like naming of the atoms and not just the types. Yeah. 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 Um, and since the ACS talk was about um, software sustainability, I spoke a little bit about, you know, um, using um, different, using um, testing and test coverage. And um, I just want to give a shout out to Molsey's Cookie Cutter um, that was started with, for, um, with Levi here um, in the lab. And it's really great. It makes it very easy to get all the hookups to the different, um, to the different um, tags. So, um, and also I want to talk a little bit about um, how I test CMILES. So given that different version updates can change the, can change the canonicalization of CMILES, I do test, I, I think I have around like 2,000 molecules from Drug Bank that I test every time to make sure that um, nothing changed and I have different environments that test, um, you know, the current version of the software and the older version of the software and then that tells you if something changed because if you have tests passing in the older version but it's not passing in the current version, then, um, you know, it helps you figure out what has changed and if it's important enough to then go and update the indices that you already have in the database. So while we're pinning the version, if changes are big enough, then maybe we'll go ahead and update all the indices and update the pin version. But this allows us to, you know, maintain integrity of the data and decide if we do need to update the indices. Like, currently there was a change that I thought was pretty significant, um, where Articid started considering uh, nitrogen in a, in a three-carbon ring as stereogenic. And before that, it hadn't. So that's because that follows IUPAC standard, and you know that's I think pretty. You know that would be something that maybe we would update the database for. I mean, we're we're still, you know, we're not fully in production yet. So, but you know that would be so, that would be a change that's significant. Okay, so now we can talk about science. Um, so. I'm going to be talking about the, um, the other part that I've been working on, which is fragmenting molecules for quantum chemical torsion scans. Now, why do we need to fragment molecules for torsion scans? Um, number one is the expense. You know, that's the obvious reason. Torsion scans are expensive. You need to run many geometry optimizations. And if we look at the distribution of drug-like molecules in drug bank, um, 
you know, the, um, these calculations um, grow depending on the level of theory. I'm actually using anywhere from like n cubed to like n to the six. So, you know, the number, you, you want to you wanna minimize the amount of heavy atoms you have in your molecule, and you also want to minimize the amount of rotatable bonds you have in your molecule because then you'll have like an explosion of torsions that you need to drive. That's, you know, that's, that's the obvious reason. But another reason for wanting to keep your fragment small is currently in the force field, um, the torsion parameters do not incorporate correlations between different torsions. So you want to make sure to isolate the torsions and not, not convolute it with intramolecular interactions. And the larger your molecule becomes, the, you know, the higher probability you'll have in, intramolecular interactions. And it just becomes harder um, to, you know, to keep it um, clean. So, you know, ideally you wanna have the smallest fragment that you can possibly have that is still representative of the chemistry of the parent molecule. So what are the problems when you're fragmenting molecules for torsion scans? So let's take a look at this biphenyl here. We're gonna look at the central bond. The central bond of this biphenyl um, is, you know, if you look at, this is the corresponding torsion scan. Um, you look at it, it looks like a freely rotating bond. You know, there are some barriers, but you know, you can freely rotate this. But then well, if all you do is protonate the nitrogen on this ring, your barrier heights go up. And then if you deprotonate the oxygen, your, barrier, your barriers go up even higher. <laughs> and then when you have this winter ion, um, you end up with a scan that looks closer to a double bond than a single bond. Um, so what is going on here? Um, if you draw the resonance structure of this winter ion, you end up with, you, you realize that the central bond is part of the conjugated system. And um, therefore it makes sense that the barrier heights are this high. But the problem is, you know, there, there are several problems here. Number one is that most chemi informatics toolkits will flag, um, will flag, won't consider this a double bond. This will be considered a single bond. Um, so, you know, that's, that's one issue. Another issue is if you have, say you have the torsion scan of this biphenyl without the oxygen there, can you use that torsion scan to, for, you know, can you just frag, can you just cut off that oxygen there, right? You probably shouldn't. Um, and the other problem is, which um, is more about um, chemical perception, is can you use the same torsion parameters for the neutral form and the Zwitter ion form? Um, you know, that's, that's something that's more of a question for um, chemical perceptions, which I'm not going to talk about right now, but I've done a little work on this. So the question is, can we, um, can we predict when a molecule, when, when a bond will be conjugated? So it turns out there is a measure that we can calculate, it's called the Weibert bond order, and it's the measure of the electron population overlap between two atoms. You can calculate this from a semi-empirical um, QC calculation, um, which is basically the quadratic sum of the, um, it's the quadratic sum of the density matrix um, over the occupied orbitals in atom, B, atom A and atom B that are part of the bond. And when you calculate these values, um, you get a value that pretty strongly um, correlates with what chemists think about when they think, of, when they think about multiplicities of bonds. So in this case, in this case that you're neutral, um, the neutral molecule has a bond order of around one, and the Zwitter ion has a bond order of around 1.5, um, which is aromatic. Now, if you take the barrier heights of these different molecules and you plot it against the Weibert bond order, um, you actually see that the relationship is linear, um, which I think was pretty striking. Um, and the question is, how can we use this? And is this general, right? Um, you know, you can think about if it is general, then that means can you extrapolate torsion parameters without having to run all the scans for all the like different tautomers? Um, yeah. 
Okay, so, you know, that was looking at, that was, you know, the motivating example that got me started um, for this project. But then I wanted to see what does the vibrant bond order look like for drug-like molecules in general. So I looked at the distribution of the vibrant bond orders for um, the FDA approved molecules in drug bank and I divided, I took out the bonds that were in rings and the bonds that weren't in rings because the bonds that are in rings, well, I'm not going to be fragmenting rings because, you know, I, you know, we just know that from intuition that we shouldn't be doing that. So that, I'm not really concerned about that, but it's interesting to see how, you know, where the peaks are because if you look at the orange um, distribution, which are the bonds and rings, you get a peak at 1 and 1 1.5, which is what you would expect, right? Um, and in the blue one are the bonds not in rings, you have, you know, a very high peak at 1 and then you have a peak at 2 and a peak at 3. Um, the vibrant bonds, so these vibrant bond orders were calculated using AM1, and over there they tend to be slightly underestimated. So it makes sense that it's shifted a little bit um, to the right. I forget what 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 is it using it to what goes into the input of the bond order? Was the charge or anything? Um, it's the density matrix. Density matrix. Okay. So <laughs> now the. The bonds that we are concerned about are the bonds that have vibrant bond orders that fall between 1 and 1 1.5. And yeah, I mean, there is some density there. And these are, these are the bonds that um, we're going to be focusing on. OK, so what can vibrant bond orders teach us about the chemical environments of bonds? So as I said, the vibrant bond order is a function of the um, density, electronic density which, as we know, is a function of conformation. So does the vibrant bond orders change with conformation? So to answer that question, I mean, well, they do, um, but I also want to see how they change with, con with, with conformation. So I generate a whole bunch of conformers for kinase inhibitors, and I will be going through gefitinib um, as a representative example of what the data looks like. So um, we have, I'm only looking at the bonds that are not in rings. So, I have 239 conformers calculated the vibrant bond order for each one of them. And if we look at the single carbon-carbon bonds, um, you can see that the vibrant bond orders are pretty tightly distributed around one, right? But then when we look at the, at the bonds involved in ethers, um, in the ethers, you start seeing multimodality. And then, you know, where it gets interesting is the bonds between the conazolate and the benzene. You have the yellow bond and the purple bond. And what you see is that the purple bond is, you know, it's bimodal. There are, you know, two peaks, you know, higher variance. Um, but then you have that yellow um, distribution, which looks pretty tight. And um, why, why is that? Well, it turns out, so both of these bonds are conjugated. But if you draw the resonance structure um, for those bonds, what you find is, is that the two um, resonance structures where the double bond is between the nitrogen and the quinazoline, over there the negative charges are on nitrogens, which is more stable. Uh, but in this case, where the double bond is between the nitrogen and the benzene, you got a negative charge on the carbon, so it's less table, stable. So it turns out that the, you know, the purple bond is stronger coupled with the quinazoline than the, than the other bond to the benzene and it shows up in the distribution of the vibrant bond order. So now, when I looked at it more closely and I looked at the conformations of the, of the molecule of that bond at the different modes, um, what I found is that in the, in the mode of the higher vibrant bond order, the conformation was planar so that it can conjugate, and then where the vibrant bond order was lower, it was out of plane, and that's where um, it can conjugate. So, um, yeah, it, it, you know, the, the, the variance of the vibrant bond order really tells us a lot about the chemical environment in the bond. Now, besides... Quick question. Yes. The whole second part of the molecule has moved back because it's unfavorable to be there, or is it randomly showing that kind of So these confirmations were generated by Omega, and they're generated using libraries, um, Torsion libraries. So I didn't drive it. I just like generated a whole bunch of confirmers and looked at what the values are for the different bonds. But actually, I'll show, I'll show later that it, it's anti-carolase and torsion scans. So the higher the barrier is, the more variance there is. 
the more modality is. I'll, I'll show it later. It's, it's at the end, yeah. Um, okay, so besides the variance telling us about the chemical environment, we can also look at the correlations of the vibrant bond order, and the correlations tell us about where the, conjug the conjugated systems. So um, again, we're, what we're looking over here at your left is the correlation map between all bonds against all bonds. And the first thing that pops out is the benzene ring, right? Where you have, you know, correlate, where the alternating bonds are anti-correlated with, with, with each other for different conformations, um, which makes sense uh, when you think about um, aromaticity. And then um, we have the fuse ring system, which also forms this block of um, correlation. And then we have this other ring, um, which, you know, they're, it's also correlated with each, the bonds are also correlated with each other. It's not as strongly as an aromatic ring because it's not um, aromatic. But where it gets very interesting is if you look at, again, if you look at the purple and the yellow bond, what you find is that the purple bond, which as we showed is, you know, more conjugated or is, you know, more strongly coupled with a quinazoline, it's also, the, the, it's also more correlated with a fused ring versus the yellow bond. Okay, that's just showing that. In the fused ring, is it possible to draw order between the two rings? So you look at the correlations, or you can't tell? Um, like, look at colors, you can't tell. Right? Well, so I haven't... Okay, so I actually looked at um, vibrant bond orders of like these fused ring systems where things start getting weird, right? Mm -hmm. Because you have you know, they're not equally shared with each other, and it does show up. Um, I haven't, like, spent time to draw out and figure out, like, if this matches, if the, if the correlation and, like, not that strongly correlated matches up with that. Um, I'm assuming it probably does. But like a free, free ring system. Probably. So I've, I've, I've done some, I've just done it just to check to see what happens. Yeah. Um, and it definitely is not like, if you look at a regular benzene ring, it's pretty much like almost 1.5 all around. Um, but with these like naphthalines and, and like other ones, it's not that way. You have like some are higher, some are lower, depending if they're in the center versus outside. And yeah, so it does follow that roughly. And then if you look at the ethers, um, you know, the bonds in the ethers are very strongly correlated with each other. And they're also slightly correlated with a fused ring. Um, you see that the red and grayish ones are more strongly correlated with a fused ring than the others. And turns out, I'm not going to show it here, but it turns out if you end up drawing the resonance structure, that one is more stable if the other bond between the nitrogen and the quinazoline are is, is in the double bond resonance structure. So it's it, you know it shows up like that. And then you know the single bonds they're not really correlated with um, anything. And so this. This kind of pattern, I, I've, I've done this for all kinase, I mean, what was the FDA kinase, um, FDA approved kinase inhibitors last year, and mostly follow, you know, similar patterns. So, um, if the Weiberg bond order, um, the Weiberg bond order tells us a lot about chemical environments um, through its dependence on conformation, right? Um, but if it's dependent on conformation to tell us about the chemical environment, can we actually use it as a meaningful? indicator. Um, so to answer that question, I first looked at the standard deviation of the Weiberg bond orders with respect to conformation. And what I'm plotting over here, what I'm showing here is the, is the distribution of the standard deviations over different molecules, you know, for their conformations. And if you look at it, you see that most of the standard deviations um, with respect to conformations fall below 0 0.02. Okay, so the differences are not that big. Um, so to look at it um, even further, um, I did a brute force combinatorial fragmentation of molecules. So what that means is I took um, the kinase inhibitor set, um, fragmented everywhere, and then combinatorially rebuilt fragments. And then for each one of these fragments, I generated a whole bunch of conformers and calculated the vibric bond orders for all those bonds, and then looked at the distribution of all, each bond in different chemical environments of the vibric bond order. So uh, what we're looking, so we're, I'm just gonna take you through one example of what this data looks like. So here we're looking at the, the graph in it, 
and we're looking at the bond between the benzene and the sulfur. And this is what the distribution of the Viber bond order looks like if this bond is in the parent molecule. Okay? Now, then when I look at all the fragments that have this bond in it and look at the distribution of the Viber bond orders, this is what I get. And if you look at it, you see that they, they obviously fall into three separate bins. Actually, four, there's one on its own bin up there. Uh, with the red one, I'm pointing to the red one, that's the vibrant bond order of that bond in the parent environment, in the parent molecule. So when I looked at the different fragments in these bins, what turns out was different between them was the removal of the fluorine on the benzene ring. So in everything in the yellow bin, all the fragments have two fluorines on the benzene. Um, all of the fragments in the light blue bin only had one fluorine. And all the, all the benzenes in the dark blue bin had no fluorines. Um, but turns out it gets even more complicated or interesting, whatever way you're going to look at it um, here, is that depending if you have the ring attached to the nitrogen, so if you, have, if you don't have the ring, that, that um, decreases the vibrant bond order. So it turns out, this fragment that has two fluorines here, which really, well, the other ones with two fluorines are in this bin, ends up being shifted um, to a smaller vibrant bond order. And then this molecule that only has one fluorine that all the other ones fall in here ends up in the yellow bin because it doesn't have the ring. And, you know, here you have um, the fragment without any fluorines. Um, it's also slightly shifted. So, so, there, so the vibrant bond order, you know, it changes with conformation, but it also changes with um, what chemical environment it's in. And um, the question is, can we, can we use these changes as an indicator? And um, how, much, how much does it change with respect to the conformation? And can we decouple the sterics effects and the resonance effects? So, with, 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 with this set, um, it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, you remove the fluorine, the electronics changes, um, but the fluorine is also, like it's not in the 1-4 interaction, but it's in the 1-5 interaction, and probably if you're going to be driving the torsion, you're going to keep those two fluorines there, you wouldn't get rid of it, because there's also some sterics. So I wanted to generate a set that separates the, that where, where all the changes will be only resonance and inductive, not steric. So to do that, I generated a set of phenyls with different, um, with different functional groups. So I, create, I generated a combinatorial set. So, so for example, I had, let's say I used phenoxide and R1 for this phenyl, and then for R2 I used all other functional groups, and the same for um, each one of them. So I ended up with around like um, 96 molecules for each R group, right, with all the other ones on the other side. And then for each one of them, I calculated the vibrant bond order for that R1 group. And as you can see, with this, I chose functional groups that, that cover, you know, electron donating and electron withdrawing groups, so I get to see the different effects. Um, did you also do the, um, what's it, the ortho version of the ring, or just the... No, I just did meta and para, because ortho involves 1-5 interactions, and I wanted to not have any of the sterics. I wanted to make sure that I'm separating the sterics. That's only resonance and inductive effects. Um, so, okay, so this is what um, the data looks like. So first I, so up until now, whenever I calculated the vibrant bond order, I had one confirmation at a time, calculate the vibrant bond order for it. Um, in this case, I was, but, I mean, if we're going to be using it for a way to, like for a surrogate, we don't want it to be so dependent on confirmation. So we want to be able to estimate the Viber bond order for whatever the confirmation is of a certain molecule. So for that, um, OpenEye has um, the um, ELF, they call it, elect electrostatically least interaction, interacting functional groups, um, which Chris, um, I think Chris Bailey was the one who did that, um, which basically looks for conformers that are stable for AM1 BCC charges so that the charges don't fluctuate a lot. 
And the basic idea there is that you don't want the strongly electrostatic interacting group to be close together to avoid intramolecular interactions. So it generates conformers, finds the ones that are lower energy that has less of these, um, that has less of these, um, you know, polar groups interacting with each other and takes like an average of 10 of those conformers from the lowest 2% uh, um, energy of the conformers. And turns out when I looked at it, it's very reproducible. Like it's very stable. I, I recalculate it many times and I always get the exact same value. So, um, you know, you, you, you get an estimate of, you know, it, you, you don't have the, the variance because of the confirmation. So this is looking using, using that vibrant bond order. So if you look at, at the phenoxide, I'm looking at the vibrant bond order of where phenoxide is R1 with all other functional groups in R2. Now, what's interesting is they all have, there's all like, there's a distribution, right? For each one of them, you get a distribution of vibrant bond order. But what's also interesting, just to see the trend that you see here, as the vibrant bond orders become smaller with the more electron withdrawn groups, um, which is you know which is just interesting. So I'm just going to look closely at the um, N ethyl group here just to show you what the data looks like. Um, so in this case, I have you know these um, molecules with um, what the vibrant bond order there is. Um, these just have the N um, ethyl groups, but this one also has um, other groups, other functional groups, and turns out that the Weibert bond order decre um, increases with more electron withdrawing groups, which actually makes sense when you think about it, because that allows the nitrogen to share. The nitrogen is electron donating, so if you have, let's say, the phenoxide electron donating, it's pushing electrons in, and then um, the nitrogen can't you know, won't, won't be pushing that, that many electrons back. But if you have, if you have um, the, the, if you have the, you know, the, the positively charged nitrogen, it's pulling electrons and that allows the, you know, the donate, the do, donating electrons of the nitrogen. So the fiber bond order increases. And how does it matter? So, so um, I, yeah, this, it's, it's, the patterns are similar. Well, you see it, it also increases the strength, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and depending on which functional groups, you know, some, some the para is stronger than the meta, and you know, depending on like if it's donating or withdrawing. Is it true that variance of meta is smaller than the para? That's what I expect. Because you don't get conjugation. You just got. Um, I think so. I do think so. Um, I think so, but I don't remember exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, you see, you see the strongest effects with a para, and you see it also like the difference between like the phenoxide and the and the and the positively charged nitrogen, right? That's where you see the biggest difference. Um, okay, so then I looked at what what are what's the distribution of the standard deviation for this set, right? And turns out that the that the standard deviation is a lot bigger. You know, it's definitely bigger than the changes that you see for confirmation. So what that's telling us is that yes, we could use changes in the vibrant bond order as an indicator that the chemical environment has changed because the changes um, that happen in the change of chemical environment are bigger than the changes that happen, uh, statistically is bigger than the changes that happen with confirmation. So for that set that I showed before, I then took the set and generated um, torsion, see, um, torsion scans to see if the, you know, if the, if, if we still have that trend of, as I showed early, earlier with the, with the biphenyl groups, where the increase in vibrant bond order also increases the torsion barrier heights. So here we're going to look at this nitro group. Um, and the reason why I'm looking at the nitro group was because the nitro group in general had like a pretty low vibrant bond order, so I was curious if the trend is still there for like the lower vibrant bond orders. Um, and turns out it is there. So this I'm just looking at what the torsion scan looks like um, for this bond. And this is just, oh, okay, all, all of this was run using QC Archive, and the data is available on QC Archive. You know, you can look at it and play with it, whatever. Um, so it turns out, if you look at the, so, I used Psi4 to do the torsion scans, 
And Psi-4 can also calculate um, the Weiberg bond orders. And the stars are the Weiberg bond order for each conformation in the torsion scan. And as you can see, they're perfectly anti-correlated. And turns out that's the reason why you see the multimodality. And it makes sense that your variance is going to be higher with higher barriers because, you know, if your barriers are low, your distribution is going to be pretty tight. But if your barriers are high and the Weiberg bond orders are anti-correlated with a torsion scan, then yes, that's what you're going to get. Right. Um, and, you know, here I'm looking at, dif at, the, at different molecules with different functional groups with decreasing um, vibrant bond orders, and you see the same trend. Okay. And then when you plot it on the line, the way I did with the biphenyl, again, you see a very similar trend where um, the, the relationship is linear. So here we're looking at more functional groups and more molecules, and um, I'm just showing a little bit because later I'll show all of them, and it's just it's just it's a lot of data, so it's hard to look at. It's easier to look at with less data at, on it, and you know most of them are following the same trend. And then this is just plotting all of the data on it, and again most functional groups do follow the same trend. So it seems to be somewhat general. I mean I wouldn't I wouldn't say yet. And it's fully general because it's by fen it's like just this fennel with functional groups. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a limited, um, I mean, there's still chemical diversity there, but it's, it's pretty limited, but the trends are still there. What about the one group that is anti-correlated? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that yeah, just yeah. enough data? Yeah. I, no, 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 no. There's actually... Um, oh, so if you drill lines, the entire um, data set. Well, no, I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm addressing it. I'm Can addressing it. Back, yeah. um, you know, are showing both curves. Which one? Yeah, here. Um, so I knew the tops of the barriers are correlated to the bone order, but could you actually reproduce these entire torsion scans by multiplying the fiber bond order by some constant? It looks like you could, right? Maybe. Um, I guess just look at correlations of different points on this curve. Yeah. You could also plot the torsions instead of as energies as expected populations, and then they'll have the same. So yeah, yeah. That, well, no, somewhat different because it's like e to the negative yeah, kt, right? right? It's not. Yeah, it's but exponential, least, but. Yeah, at least the peaks will be at the same spot. Yeah, the peaks will be at the same spot. Yeah, the peaks will be at the same spot. That's even much more magnificent result. Um, yeah, but I mean, that would be interesting, but how would it be useful? Um, well, don't you need the whole curves to fit your question? Yeah, but the problem is that I'm still going to have, if I want to, if I want to get the torsion scan from Vibrick bond order of a torsion scan, I'm still going to have to do the torsion scan. Well, yeah, you get bond orders from torsion scans? So here, what I'm showing is I have a torsion scan, and because I'm using Psi-4, which also can calculate the bond order, I just, uh, I just already calculated for those confirmations, so I'm looking uh, at specific confirmations. So... Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Didn't we show a slide where the like, dependence of the fiber fiber top order on uh, on confirmation was quite small, so you could maybe compute WBO for just one confirmation and get an estimate of what that scale is? Um, can you repeat that again? Did if you, I can. If yeah, yeah. So I know. Yeah, I definitely. Yes. Couple, uh, you, you showed. Uh, oh, yeah. The, the blue and uh, pink thing. Right. Great. So here I had, gen I didn't do like a torsion scan, I just like generated conformers that are like lower energy conformers. Like, I, I, usually when you do the conformer generation, you don't do like all the high energy, right? It's, it's the conformational distribution that you would probably find, yeah. And that one is doing the full torsion scan. So what was your, what was, does that answer your question? So, I mean, following up on the Raffles suggestion where you, you could compute the, the, uh, the a scalar from something that's cheap, like compute the fiber bond order from just one of your confirmations and then um, use it to. Well, we might be able to, um, show, especially showing that if you have a confirmer that's a good representative of the confirmations, like something like using ELF, there is still that. So, this relationship that I'm showing here is using these ELF estimated fiber bond orders, and that relationship is still there. So yeah, I mean, it, it definitely could be possible that you can do something like that. So these are, are these means over conventional ensemble or what? Other no, so each Rybrick bond order is, um, as I explained, the ELF conformer. So basically it does like an average of 10 conformers of like the, 
it generates a whole bunch of population, then takes the 20% of the, po of, the, of the population where you have the least um, interacting, like strongly interacting electrostatic groups, and then takes an average of 10 of those. So it's, I don't think there's a paper published on it. I, um, they, they write on the, on the documentation that, um, that it's from, like it seems to be pretty stable, and I'm also seeing that it's very stable. Um, I do find that sometimes it does underestimate the um, vibrant bond orders, but I, I think that might be an AM1 thing. I don't know if it's an L thing or if it's an AM1 thing. Um, okay, so again, this is looking at all the data, and yeah, there is an anti-correlated one. So I went and looked at all the ones that are outliers and that are like not following. I mean, I looked at I looked at all the scans, and then I also looked at the scans that oh, took a lot of time. Um, so it turns out there were two issues that I saw, which just shows how these things are never straightforward. Um, so in some cases where you have a trivalent nitrogen, it can be either pyramidal or um, planar, right? So for the cases where you have these outliers, um, seven, like twice I saw where the night, like for all other molecules in the, in that series, the, 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 the nitrogen was planar, but in those that were outliers, it was pyramidal. And for all of them, it also had a phenoxide on the other group. And it might be because I wasn't using the, I wasn't using augmented basis set, like diffuse functions for the anions, and that might have created this issue. So I have to rerun it with um, diffuse um, with diffuse basis sets. Um, and the other thing that I saw was this was something this is something that torsion drive is supposed to address, which um, you know when you rotate around the bond there are other dihedrals right, and if the if the, if the other dihedrals change conformation then you might not have the lowest conformation. So there were some cases where another dihedral was rotated and then for that barrier you ended up having not the lowest energy conformer for that barrier so you had um torsion scans that are not symmetric they're like asymmetric you got like a very high barrier and then a lower barrier that um is more is, is more aligned with the trend so there were like i don't know around 10 ish scans like that that i have to rerun to make sure that i get the lowest energy conformer for it the different confirmations in the scan, so I have to rerun it. But then when you take out those, um, I hate taking out data, but like, but, you know, I have to rerun them. So, you know, this is what the trends look like without it, um, where, you know, they're pretty consistent, I would say. And the uh, distribution of slopes? Oh, yeah, I mean, that, 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 first let's go through this, but I have that. Uh, okay, so for the fragmentation scheme, using all, you know, all of this um, um, understanding of vibrant bond orders, what is our fragmentation scheme? Um, so you take a molecule, you calculate, and using an AM1 calculation, calculate the vibrant bond orders, these AM1 calculations, I'm using OpenEye, they're pretty fast, they're like tens of seconds. Not so fast, but like fast, whatever, relative. Um, and then we find the rotatable bonds. I mean, currently I'm just using well, I was using open eye, like if a bond is rotatable, but then I realized that it misses some, so I now have like the smarts pattern that matches, um, you know, more of the bonds than what open eye was finding. Um, and then for each of these bonds, I built out one bond in every direction. And now if that bond that I, bi that I built out is part of a functional group or a ring, I keep that. And that's my minimal fragment. Then I recalculate the vibrant bond order for those fragments. Now, if the, if the vibrant bond order is within a certain threshold that is chosen by the user, then that is your fragment. Um, if it's, you know, the difference is larger than a certain threshold, let's say in this case, I'm showing that, you know, the green ones, well, they're pretty close to what the parent molecule is. Um, the red one, well, it's like a, a difference of 0.1, which actually is pretty significant when vibrant bond, in, in bond orders. Um, in that case, I add on different um, functional groups, recalculate until, until you're within whatever threshold you had chosen. Now, the question is, what threshold should you use? Um, so for that, um, I looked at the distribution of slopes. Um, and this is what the distribution looks like. The mean slope is like 188 kilojoules. The median is 170. So it's like 180. 
So if you do like a back, like a rough calculation, it turns out a change of 0.1 to vibrant bond order is roughly like 7 kT um, in energy, which is pretty big. Um, so, you know, using this, you can decide how, what your threshold should be, like how much it's, you know, how, 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 how accurate do you want to be? Okay. Now, um, I'm, the next thing I'm going to show is um, newer stuff, and um, it's a little bit like I haven't finished thinking through it yet, but anyway. So now, how do you continue growing out the fragment, right? There are many different paths that you can go. And, um, and initially, like this is like my sketch that I thought I was going to find, like different paths, and there could converge. Some converge faster than other to what the value is in the parent molecule. Um, but then, you know, when I actually did it, and oops, so, so these are, are, you know, I'm using different heuristics for the paths. So one of it was, if I have a molecule and I need to grow out, and I have like two, three bonds that I can go with, I look at the vibrant bond order and the parent molecule of those bonds, and I should probably go with the higher ones, because those are more conjugated to the system, right? That's one heuristic. Another heuristic is what's the shortest path to the current bond that I'm looking at. Them trying to build a fragment for. So these are the two um, heuristics that I'm using, and these are the two different paths. Um, so we're going to be looking at this molecule and that bond. Um, turns out the data looks more complicated than um, what I thought it's going to look, um, which also makes it a little more interesting. So um, we're looking at that bond, and you know the fur and um, the parent molecule has a bond order of like one, around 1.08. Okay, so starting out with our first minimal, um, the minimal fragment that you get from just keeping, you know, the, everything around it with the rings and the functional groups, that's what you get and that's where you start out. So you might decide that's not good enough for you, you want to grow out. So you grow out, you add that nitrogen there, um, okay, you're getting a little closer. But now, you know, there are, there's more than one way you can continue growing. You can either like add that ring after the nitrogen or add that um, fast, um, I don't know what that group is called, roughly, you know. Phosphoryl, dimethyl, something. Yeah, anyway. Like, which one do you, do you choose? Well, depending on your heuristic, um, you're going to either add the ring or you're going to add that. But do you see how different the vibrant bond orders become now? Right? Um, and then, you know, you can continue growing depending on your heuristic. And it turns out, like, here, yeah, this is probably where you should stop. It's like, it's converging here. It's pretty close. But then this other heuristic using vibrant bond order is still, like, oscillating a bit. Still goes up a bit before it, you know, gets closer. Um, well, yeah. And then, you know, it gets even more complicated that, you know, larger fragments are not necessarily better. Um, so... Say you have this bond right here, you know, I'm looking at, that's the fragment I'm looking at, that's the parent, I add, um, you know, the ether, I'm still good, right? Pretty close to what I want to get. But then, you know, I just grow out a little bit, I add this um, three-membered ring and something changed in the electronics. So, so these, these um, yeah, these effects are, are pretty long range. Um, so I'm still, I'm running, so currently I'm running some, tor like I, for some of these where the differences are pretty big, I'm running some torsion scans um, to see like how different the torsion scans are. Um, but I would say like if you're gonna fragment, um, you should, you know, you should, so, um, basically if you have a certain threshold that you're okay with, um, you know, you, you'll try, you try to go with what gives you the smallest fragment for that threshold. Um, all right, so um, in summary, what we discussed, um, basically that we use CMOS to index molecules, that the vibrant bond orders can inform the chemical environments, and then when we fragment, we're using the vibrant bond order to inform us um, how we destroyed or didn't destroy the chemical environment. Um, so for future work, um, we got to integrate this all with um, QC Archive. Um, and also for future work, which I don't have on this, is to have some way to score the fragment. Like, because it's not, 
it's not like there's not one clear cut way of doing this, right? The different heuristics are fragmenting where your threshold to be. Um, so I am, you know, thinking about having some sort of way to score how, like if you have a set of molecules and you're fragmenting it using some parameters or some scheme, like how good does it do overall? Right. Um, and with that, um, I'd like to thank the many people that have been um, very helpful. Um, I want to thank, you know, John and everyone in the group, um, Josh and, um, you know, Raffle for always listening to my good plots. Um, and then, um, of course, Chris Bailey and Okanai um, has been really great. Um, people at the Torsion channels who have been active. Um, Lee Ping with Yudung, David and Caitlin, and everyone at Molsi who has, um, you know, created this QCR project, which is really, really, really nice. And with that, I will take questions. Is there anyone still online? Yeah. Any questions from online first? Yeah, let's do the online questions first. Anyone online have a question? Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Are there any questions here? When you um, did distributions, right? They said you said they clustered into three or four groups. You know which one I'm talking about, right? Which one? That, like, and I explored the distributions so it was early on. Which one? This one? Yeah. So do you just cluster by hand, or you you end up with some other? Oh, how I how I cluster? So yeah. I used um. Um, the, so, okay, so I did it two ways. So first I sorted it by the ELF estimate, just so that I can see, right? So I had so much data and I just sorted it. And then for the colors, I used like the score of the difference in um, the distribution to the parent molecule. So I think these, these, these are color coded by the MN, the mean, the maximum mean difference to the, um, to yeah. the to the distribution so yeah but yeah this was a lot of data to look at uh, so if there's nothing else online um thank you hi for talking and thank you carmen for organizing and yeah i think that's everything